So I think uh, our next uh, talk is uh, Greg Cooper, and this is the Estimating Impact Group, which used to be, didn't, weren't you the ones called the Functional Variant Group? And right. You not only rejected your charge, but your name, too. That's right, so. yes. <laughs> so, yeah, so you can see the, the, the group members up there on the slide. So, yeah, so we were charged with, with functional annotation, but um, in fact, sort of, uh, I originally objected to it, and then we sort of had to come to a consensus on what, what we really meant by that. And, so the, we came up with this term impact, which is uh, maybe less precise in a lot of ways, but it actually was sort of more to, to the point of what we're really interested in. And so we th I think it's worth differentiating what categories of terms that we're talking about when we say Im what does impact mean. So one way to measure this is to talk about things in terms of damage. So uh, you know, polyphen will tell you that something is damaging to a protein. And basically, we interpret this that this is something, a molecular statement, that some variant has an effect on a particular molecular function, whether or not that molecular function actually has, a, has an effect at the sort of uh, phenotype level, the lar more overt phenotype. Then something is deleterious. So this, uh, a lot of information that we get is actually from evolution. And the term deleterious means that it, a, a variant would result in reduced fitness, so essentially reduced survival and reproductive success. And then, of course, there's the term pathogenic or, or causal, these other sorts of disease-related terms when a variant causally contributes to a specific illness. And these are highly correlated terms, and a lot of the reason that we rely on, on annotation and use them is because we're leveraging the fact that variants that are molecularly damaging and that are evolutionarily de deleterious are heavily enriched among uh, uh, disease causal variants, but they're, they're not the same thing, and it's worth always keeping that sort of distinct. So most annotation tools that people use uh, uh, essentially estimate one or two, one or both of the first two terms. Either they estimate sort of molecular effects or they estimate evolutionary effects. They don't really, uh, at least generally speaking, they don't estimate the latter, the, which is what we're most interested in is disease relevance. And then lots of models which we'll talk about are hybrids that sort of combine both biochemistry, uh, so they make damaging predictions and they also consider uh, evolution as well. So <laughs> that being said, uh, annotations are obviously extremely important to uh, uh, this whole sort of process, just because of the fact that genetic information is just not going to be sufficient for reasons that we've, we've gone over um, uh, repeatedly. And the basic idea here is that annotations allow us to uh, uh, at least get around the original assumption that uh, the sort of the ideal genetic assumption of if we just treat all the variants the same and come up with a purely genetic, ar genetic argument that something is important, we're just not going to be able to define lots of true biology that way. So we can use annotations to the extent that they are truly different for causal variants relative to not causal variants. And the big distinction here, and it's, it's a very tough question to answer, is that we have to differentiate hunches so a typical candidate gene or just so story is not sort of a, a very well validated and robust predictor of causality. Uh, but we do, in fact, have annotations that we believe are, are systematically and quantitatively relevant. And we talked about this earlier that really the goal here should be uh, uh, quantification you know, what is the actual change in prior probability for variant X versus variant Y based upon what we know about it? Uh, and then that being said, there's also this notion of uh, a lot of times we think in terms of multiple testing and correcting for multiple tests, but it's really about, uh, uh, at least I find it more useful to think about the hypothesis quality. So uh, not so much how many you're testing, but what is, how good is that hypothesis to start with? So in other words, what is the likelihood that something positive will come out? So asking is variant randomly selected variant X associated with disease is very different than saying is randomly selected nonsense variant associated with disease. Those are two very different hypotheses. <clears throat> and because of that, so for example, uh, we all sort of assume that protein disrupting variants are enriched for disease causal variants. And this is, in fact, an annotation driven assumption about the genome uh, that has enabled lots of discovery. So this is an example that we've already seen once today and uh, is from Jay's lab a few years ago where uh, essentially, the top row here, uh, uh, you have sort of both genetic information and uh, genomic inf information being blended here together into drilling down to the bottom right here, which is on a single causal gene for uh, this particular Mendelian disease. And it, it sort of, again, predicates upon they eliminate all synonymous variants, for example. That's a functional assumption about we're interested in non-synonymous because we believe that disease variants are enriched among that set. And in this case, it works. So there's some sort of anecdotal evidence that, that this is a strategy, that, and there's lots of studies like this that leverage this assumption. That being said, so, uh, you know, how do we really know that annotations are useful? And the short answer is that we, we won't get, you know, clear, quantitative, unbiased estimates in the way that we would normally like, which is we would need large collections of 
truth and large collections of, uh, you know, large collections of, of things that are really causal and things that are not causal and everything in between, and then we could actually sort of quantify what properties differentiate them, but we can't really do that. So instead, what we uh, end up going to, and we'll see that as we show some of the data that, um, that we have available to support annotations, is sort of indirect ways to measure the utility of, of annotations to infer uh, disease-relevant properties, one of which is changes to allele frequency. So Basically, if you can predict variants that are deleterious, they should have, on average, sort of uh, uh, lesser diversity, lower uh, frequency levels in human populations because of selection. We can look at retrospective analysis of what we previously known variants, uh, either through databases or study by study through anecdotes. Uh, and then, as I'm sure we'll hear about later, so comparisons to experimental measures of function, uh, especially for predicting damage. <clears throat> so uh, I'll sort of now talk about the different types of information that we leverage. So the first is, um, compared to sequence analysis, and this is actually, uh, this type of information is really crucial to, you know, essentially most methods of variant annotation and prediction in some way leverage this basic source of data, which is that when we sequence uh, lots and lots of genomes uh, from, other different, from other species and we compare them to the human sequence, we find regions like this where uh, you have a high degree of similarity throughout evolution, and it's not just a matter of similarity, it's comparing that similarity to a, a model of neutral evolution but the point is that we can say uh, fairly confidently that there's something about this particular stretch of our genomes that has, an, has a, a function. We don't really know what that function is, but we believe that when, it's, when, that, when these bases are mutated that they're deleterious because otherwise we would see a lot more diversity in this, uh, this particular region. And the, the one advantage to this kind of approach is that it's, it's agnostic with respect to any molecular function. In fact, we don't really know what this does at a molecular level, but we believe that it does something important. And, and and that means that mutations are probably uh, cause disease or very well might cause disease. So how, uh, like I said, one way to do this is to look at uh, does this correlate with l levels of diversity? And in fact, if we quantify what we just saw in that picture at an individual base pair uh, uh, level, we can see that sites that have higher conservation scores, sort of moving to the, uh, the um, along the x-axis here, these are conservation scores, tend to correlate with a reduction in derived low frequency. This is from uh, the Exxon paper a few, few years ago, but we see this over and over again. This is a very reproducible trend uh, that variants at highly conserved positions tend to be at lower allele frequencies, so we can sort of infer that there is purifying selection operating here. An important thing to consider is that this is, is in fact, a site-specific uh, correlation. So in fact, if you just take the conservation score one base to the left or one base to the right, you essentially obliterate this correlation, suggesting that, again, it is selection acting on individual sites that's important. And so we also see this trend, albeit heavily reduced, at the non-coding level. So this is sort of telling you the effect of, uh, again, the exomes, the fact that you're in an exome carries a lot of information. There is more signal to noise when you're considering conservation measures at the per base level than there is at the non-coding level. But you can still see we see a very highly significant uh, negative correlation between past conservation and modern diversity. <clears throat> so however, there's this notion of can we use conservation to predict disease? And this is, I'll just show this one slide, this is a, a, a look at the previous table we showed from Jay's lab in the Freeman-Sheldon case, where along the x-axis here, these bars represent the number of candidate genes that, that shake out of the analysis as you move from, uh, uh, essentially from uh, models where the disease is a result of a different gene in every, in every patient to a model of, of a monogenic form where all the families have the same causal gene. And then so they get down to, you know, something like 10 or 20 genes based upon uh, eliminating everything that's synonymous. And then after they eliminate dbSNP, then only MYH3 remains. So one way to look at this is could we do this without knowing about function and instead just use conservation scores? And in fact, we get a pattern that looks like this. So if we just set some arbitrary thresholds on the conservation scores of, of, of different levels of sort of stringency on relative to the genome, in fact, we do very similarly. And, and keep in mind, we don't impose any functional, and, uh, functional assumptions about this. So there are synonymous variants contributing to this as well. And then the other advantage is that and this is sort of a general feature of quantitative versus qualitative features is that we can sort of step aside from arbitrary thresholds and start talking about things like ranks. And so in this case, for example, uh, without reverting, without using dbSNP, uh, the conservation metrics would have told you that the, the causal gene here was the, the top ranked candidate gene. So in some ways we're doing, uh, doing more with less with this sort of quantitative information. This is conservation of each individual nucleotide, each individual variant position. Okay, so, uh, and we've now seen this, there, there are, this is 
all, again, all anecdotal, but this is accumulating a, a, a lot, a, a large number of anecdotes are contributing to these uh, kinds of observations. <laughs> of course, the other major flavor of annotation dependent information is, of course, uh, molecular function. So, uh, obviously, a lot of this is driven by gene models. So, we can say a, a, an extensive uh, uh, list of information of the different kinds of mutation events and how they impact a gene or a transcript. Uh, so many of these are, are listed here. And of course, within the space of variants that are missense, so, uh, so obviously loss of function variants, so stop codons and, and frame shifts sort of things are special, are special relevance, but within the, the realm of missense variants, we can leverage lots of information because we know lots about the biochemistry of proteins. So this is uh, a, a figure from the uh, recent paper describing polyphen, uh, the most recent version of polyphen, where in fact you have uh, uh, several different sources of information. So you have annotations of protein features you have structural information about, uh, uh, about the protein's uh, sort of three-dimensional and secondary structure. And then actually polyphen also uses uh, uh, evolutionary information. So there's a multiple sequence alignment. And in fact, beyond just measures of sequence conservation, which is important, you can also look at things like what types of uh, mutation events are, are tolerated. So are they all hydrophobic residues? Are they all small amino acids? That sort of information is also present in multiple sequence alignments that tell you a lot that simple structural predictions can't tell you. And in fact, when you sort of merge these source of information and, and uh, into a single probabilistic classifier like polyphen, you can show that, again, uh, given, uh, and this is driven by databases of known variants, that you can get reasonably good uh, accuracy at differentiating the variants that we believe based upon the known databases are causal versus those that are, 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 are not causal. So there is some evidence supporting the utility of these scores for predicting disease relevance. <clears throat> of course, most of the genome is not protein, and we'd like to think about moving to whole genomes, and it's, it's more difficult, but projects like ENCODE are, are really uh, dramatically uh, reshaping our ability to annotate molecular function in the rest of the genome. So this is just a slide shot from the PLOS paper last year, where you can, uh, and you can see the GWAS catalog up on top there, and you can very quickly link all of those GWAS hits to a whole variety of, of uh, kinds of molecular function annotations, including transcripts, obviously, but also including things like hypersensitive sites, transcription factor binding sites. And in fact, in the most recent ENCODE paper, uh, and this is work from, from John Stam and other, other people, uh, that there is very significant overlap between, when you look at, at rates of overlap between SNPs and hypersensitive sites, say, with, versus uh, a GWAS, so a genome-wide association study hits, there's a very non-random overlap. So it's telling you that, in fact, these annotations are enriching for functional variants that are likely contributing directly to uh, uh, these, these phenotypes, contributing directly to disease risk. So there is some utility of these uh, molecular annotations. And the good news is that both the uh, ENCODE style annotations and the comparative genomic annotations will only get better because those experiments are getting cheaper and more, you know, more cell types, uh, more factors, uh, more genomes, all that sort of stuff will make these uh, uh, better annotations. That being said, there are a variety of, of caveats and, and concerns that have to be taken into account. So the first and foremost is annotations uh, are not, you know, neither necessary nor sufficient for causality. You know, genetics is the first and best source of information for this. These are really a, a, a supporting role. Uh, another issue is that the positive predictive value for, from annotations is, is low for any given variant. So if you just said non-synonymous, you know, that applies to lots of variants that don't do anything. Uh, same thing if you said a variant is highly conserved. Again, there's lots of variants that don't do anything that are, uh, quote, unquote, highly conserved. So you can't, this is not nowhere near a, a single bit of information, but when you use it in aggregate sense, it can become powerful. And there are limitations to both uh, the com uh, comparative genomic and uh, molecular function kind of annotations. So for example, uh, you know, comparative sequence analysis is something that's the assumption that's often overlooked is that you assume that, that all the animals are, that you're comparing, that the, the function of those bases is the same. So if, if Zebrafish, if a zebrafish protein is in your alignment, you assume that that protein does the same thing in fish as it does in human beings. Uh, basically, you're assuming that that, that uh, orthology is, is consistent. Sequence alignment is an, an, an unappreciated problem. It's very difficult, and quality can be a, uh, an issue, so it really should not be taken for granted in these kinds of scores. Uh, and of course, in molecular annotations, there's lots of errors and oversimplifications, and I'll show a few examples of that. And then there's this irony that that the most interesting variants from a biological point of view are actually uh, substantially enriched for, for errors, since errors don't have to undergo purifying selection. So uh, here's just one example of uh, a slide from Shamil showing that 
you know, evolutionary sequence conservation has limitations with respect to predicting what are the selective consequences of a mutation at that site. And that really the focus here uh, should be on the bottom right here is that there's this whole range of selective pressure that is perfectly consistent with so-called complete conservation. So if you take the human genome and line it to 40 other mammals, you can get a base that's perfectly conserved. There are lots of those. And that's compatible with a very wide range of actual sort of levels of deleteriousness ranging from extreme, uh, like sort of embryonic lethality to uh, much more milder uh, measures of selection. Then, of course, there's looking at gene models. There's uh, uh, a multiplicity of genes at multiple levels. So there are different databases. The databases change over time. Within each one of those databases, there are varying numbers of transcripts that are associated with any given uh, gene. Uh, and this is true for both protein coding genes and, uh, and for non-coding RNA genes. Here's an example for, for link RNAs or different views of where link RNAs are and what their, their transcripts look like on the genome. Uh, and part of this is that gene models as static features just aren't fully capable of capturing the sort of dynamic nature of, of transcripts in human cells. <clears throat> and then, of course, there are uh, uh, context-dependent effects that can alter your interpretation of an annotation. So here's an example at the top from, um, Dan, from uh, Daniel MacArthur's paper looking at loss of function is that there's a large fraction of sort of, uh, of what would appear to be loss of function bad mutation events that knock out a protein that in fact only affect one particular uh, splice variant of that protein. So if you didn't know what the proportion of that particular splice variant is, and well, and what the portion of that splice variant is in the, the cell type that is most relevant to that disease, then you can't really make it a, a direct inference from loss of function to disease. And then of course there are context dependent effects, and this is just one example. There are compensatory mutations, for example, that can uh, rescue, so here's a, a stop codon early on in a protein that is effectively rescued by a, a new start codon that uh, produces a protein that's nearly identical. So there are these sort of context-dependent effects that can uh, uh, result in a misinterpretation of an annotation, basically. <clears throat> and I mentioned this last point, so this is just a slide showing that uh, because purifying selection reduces variation uh, at sort of more interesting, biologically interesting sites, in fact, the rate of error stays the same in terms of a, if your errors are sort of even if they're uniformly distributed across the genome here. And so uh, you really should be worried about, you know, stop codons in particular uh, are going to be enriched for just simple sequence errors even when the overall quality of the data is extremely high. You know, you can have very, very low uh, false positive rates, but they're going to be still heavily enriched amongst the most interesting sets of variants. <clears throat> okay, so where do things, uh, you know, where do we sort of see things going? Well, the, the place to really like to be is uh, unified uh, quantitative estimates that consider both sort of molecular information and uh, evolutionary information. And beyond that, we should be thinking about how we can complement variant level data. So if we look at a particular coordinate in the genome and what that, what the two different alleles are, also thinking, thinking about things like uh, there's information that's capturable in what is the overall level of conservation of a whole protein, does the, the, the gene that uh, that captures the variant, does it, is it associated with an EQTL and, and liver tissue and you're looking at a liver relevant trait or whatever the case may be. And there, that, the similar logic applies to other higher order grouping strategies, which is really going to pose a problem for evaluating what that impact might be on, on sort of false discovery rates. So this is the sort of thing where permutation and simulation are really going to be crucial to evaluate what that looks like in a, some sort of reasonable null model of that uh, type of analysis. But really an important goal should be sort of quantitative integrated measures. Uh, that capture all of the uh, assumptions that we're either explicitly or implicitly putting on our analysis of the data. Uh, so this is a slide showing, you know, and so basically we're not there yet, but we're, we're pushing towards that. And I think it's, this is a realistic goal to get these kinds of unified scores. Getting them real calibrated is going to be a real challenge, but we're, 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 there's progress to be made in the future. So here's just a figure showing if we look at the upstream region and first exon of beta globin, in fact, we know lots of disease variants in this locus, and we have lots of information. So in the middle row there, there's conservation scores. In the bottom left, we have experimental measures of function. So this is a, a, a mutagenesis assay on promoter function. On the bottom right is a measure of, of biochemistry of proteins. So we really can start to combine these, these bits of data, and they're all correlated to a certain extent, but they all tend to bring some independent information. Of course, you have gene models, motif annotation at the top. So it is realistic to start thinking about layering these different types of annotations into uh, uh, better uh, predictors of, of impact. So I'll, I'll conclude on this last slide just with some general comments. Uh, first is that there's not really likely to be a single, you know, everybody would like to say run this annotator and use this score. 
but it's, it's just unrealistic to think that's going to happen for the foreseeable future. And uh, that's also going to be true that there's going to be combinations of annotations that we'll have to use and that, and the only way to get around this is that we just need to be very, uh, very plain and transparent with how we're using them and any assumptions that they depend upon. And, and we need to be very empirical. So how many variants meet whatever criteria you're setting? How many are there in, in thousand genomes? How many are there in any one genome, in any one gene, that sorts of thing. So you can start to evaluate uh, how things rank, what the empirical FDRs might look like. Uh, to the extent that conservation is, and other evolutionary information is used, phylogenies and alignment quality really should be described. Like if you're using a polyphen score, it's worth considering what range of species that were used in the alignment that polyphen looked at to make that prediction, things like that. Um, the general property of quantitative measures being uh, having advantages over qualitative, uh, and really, and we don't want to rehash this necessarily, but uh, it should be clear when annotations are sort of defined up front, you're saying, I believe that non synonymous variants are enriched for disease ca causality to some certain extent, whether that's stated before or after you're looking at data, so really making it clear uh, uh, what the biological rationale for any given annotation is and trying to estimate what the enrichment factor might be. Uh, and we really have to be careful with, with sort of dynamic and hierarchical use of annotations, especially after you start playing with the data. This can re really implicitly expand your, uh, your search space and, and make it much easier to, to identify a non-reproducible observation or conclusion. Uh, and again, considering uh, it probably should be worth considering all the steps and all the assumptions that affect your interpretation of prior probability. So to the extent that we do exome sequencing, for example, we, it might be worth saying this is we believe that there's some enrichment factor within the exome and we're explicitly quantifying that and that places it in the, the greater genomic context of we know we're sacrificing some sensitivity but we believe that the, you know, this level of specificity that we achieve by just sequencing exome is, is worth it. Um, so, but it's worth sort of being explicit about that and trying to put numbers on it to the extent that that's possible. Uh, and so with that, I'll conclude and we can discuss it. Thank you. All right, so lots of, lots of issues covered. We did have, I think, a, a discussion of functional annotation that was going on in the previous session. Um, and, and so uh, we, can, we can carry some of that back into here. I mean, one, one key question that might be good to discuss here is the extent, how close we are or what the pathway is uh, to get to the point where we actually treat non-coding variation with the same degree of rigor that we can for coding variation, where we can actually say this variant, this variant does actually is up in the top tier of variants that are expected to be potentially disease causing. I don't know, I mean, I guess the people here who've worked on ENCODE data might be able to comment on uh, how close we are to that point and how, what the pathway is to actually get there. Since you're looking at me, I can <laughs> make some comments. So I, I think that the, um, and some of this may be um, uh, recapitulated in, in, in our session this afternoon, but I think that the point is um, we are able now to look at individual variants in the context of a native genome and make decisions whether that variant is actually for example, affecting the binding of a protein. So that is having a measurable functional consequence. Um, of course, the, the challenge then is to, is to connect that with, um, uh, with, with other, uh, you know, features that eventually are going to get you to, um, you know, ultimately something uh, clinically meaningful. Um, so I think that those type of data exist, but they don't exist uh, comprehensively. And um, it, meaning that uh, right now, uh, projects like ENCODE or the Roadmap have essentially sampled genomes opportunistically, um, and part of the difficulty is that that uh, the emphasis has been on, well, it's not a difficulty, it's sort of by design, the emphasis has been on trying to capture the breadth of regulatory phenomena that are in these genomes, and therefore you want to look at a large number of different cell types. Um, and what that has necessitated is that every single cell type is pretty much coming from a different individual. So all of the variation is pre present effectively accidentally. Um, nonetheless, uh, we so, so that's one level that, that we don't have a, a lot, but, but the you know, at least for looking at, say, GWAS data, um, uh, there are obviously, uh, you know, most of it's common variants. And so, 
many of the individuals have the data, uh, and that feature has been able to be exploited to, um, uh, to, to say some things. I think so, so um, that's one caveat. The second one is that the emergence of those properties within the annotations that have been created so far um, is largely dependent on the, uh, uh, the, literally, the sequencing depth in many cases of, of these assays. And, and so, um, for example, you, to see you know, clear evidence of abrogation of, in vivo, of uh, uh, let's say, protein binding at a particular variant in, in vivo, you need quite deep data from, you know, whether it's chip sequencing or, or, or DNA's footprinting to see that. And, and those data have not, uh, you know, they have emerged to the point where you can make these definitive calls for thousands of variants, but that doesn't really, you know, there obviously are huge numbers more. Um, so I think that, but that, the trajectory currently, um, and, and I don't know how, how uh, uh, you know, how the strategy is, is going to shift, um, or if it's going to shift, but the strategy currently is, um, doesn't really take into account trying to capture that variation systematically. Now there are projects um, uh, that, that are ongoing, uh, like the GTEx uh, project, where there's going to be systematic sampling of tissues from the same individual, um, but one is not, at least in the current conception of the project, going to have that level of information um, uh, from, from all those tissues, but one could imagine it coming in, in the future. But I, I think that, you know, as we'll cover later, one of the other points, though, is that directed assays do exist if there is a specific spot that one is interested uh, in, in looking at. Um, so that, that's one perspective on the, on the current state of those projects. Yeah, I was just going to follow up. So, you know, the, to me, the, the, the near future, we'll probably see a lot more connections to cellular phenotypes like EQTLs, you know, that being able to map a variant that disrupts a a motif that for a transcription factor and a promoter and a hypersensitive site that then we can measure actually does have an effect on transcription. Those sorts of phenotypes are going to fall very probably relatively quickly in a lot of ways. Uh, be able to map EQTLs down to functional variants will happen relatively soon, but connecting that to disease is obviously much more difficult. <clears throat> uh, so in relation to the uh, non-coding thing, one thing that you, you raised, uh, Greg, but which maybe isn't fully appreciated is the importance of the um, very good alignments to, say, CHIMP and so forth. And the th thing is, within coding regions, you, you might make that issue, but when you go into non-coding regions, people don't, I think, fully realize how grotty some of these alignments are. And, and conversely, yeah, genome assemblies. And, but conversely, what has been very clear from listening to the discussion is how valuable conservation is. Everyone would say that conservation is a useful thing. And, just trying to assess uh, conservation in non-coding regions is actually remarkably tricky. I mean, and it shouldn't be because, you know, I think with great, you know, greater um, uh, emphasis on the assemblies of these other primates and whatnot, we can probably do a lot better. I was just going to add the, the nature of mutation in coding versus non-coding is also likely to be different. And so I think you showed well, Greg, the, the base resolution in coding versus non-coding is very, very different. And if that's true, it could be an artifact of alignment, but it's probably not, then it may be that you need bigger events or a multitude of, of single nucleotide changes as a group that cause an effect on a non-coding function. So it's also going to be a different scoring scheme than what we're talking about, coding sequence and codon usage and, and that. So part of that depleted effect there, part, part of that depleted effect of, of coding versus non-coding, you can actually get a much better, so this is the sort of allele frequency versus uh, a conservation score. If you look at just transcription factor binding motifs, for example, you can really get that slope. So you never approach the, the sort of information content of an exome, but you can substantially enrich for the information content by a variety of sort of, that's, instead of looking at all non-coding variants, look at non-coding variants that are in hypersensitive sites, for example, it gets better. But. So I, I have three cautionary notes about encoding variants. <laughs> so uh, first, um, the, uh, el the, the main reason we believe in functionality of non-coding variants, and several people in the room contributed to that, is this exact observation that conservation between species contributes to changes in the frequency. Uh, however, recently we discovered a lot more complexity with bias gene conversion AI being important in allele frequency shift, uh, in potentially background selection being important in allele frequency shift. And uh, either though I do believe that what we see is signal of direct purifying selection, the complexity of this picture is much greater than um, 
uh, which wasn't appreciated in the beginning. So the second caveat, when you think about conservation, uh, the intuition is more species uh, will, will saturate phylogenetic tree and conservation would provide complete information. Uh, however, there are two caveats in, in using conservation information. Uh, and these are conceptual uh, theoretical points in, in evolutionary genetics which should be addressed. One is what we're doing in conservation, we assume constant fitness landscape. So we think that mutation which is bad for human gene uh, is also equally bad for fish gene, xenopus gene, mouse gene, and so forth. And it's not only we're not fish and live in the water, um, what's important is there is a pistasis. So there are compensatory changes, multiple compensatory changes, and all methods look at conservation in a single site. Um, and uh, we look together with Nico Katsanis and his set of experiments, and you have a variant which is in his rescue experiment in zebrafish, is shown to be pathogenic, doesn't rescue zebrafish phenotype. However, this exact human mutation is wild type in zebrafish gene, which works perfectly. And we see 8%, about 8% of human mutations like this. And, and I, I just don't know what to do it. You, we, we don't, you, uh, it doesn't help to have very large phylogenetic tree with conservation. And the last, the last cautionary note is the use of intermediate phenotypes. So we, we can talk about uh, association with um, DNA sites, DSQTLs, we can talk about EQTLs. And what surprises me, and I, I think this is more question to the community, when we think about LDL being intermediate phenotype to myocardial infarction, all, most LDL peaks, GWAS peaks, have influence on infarction. This works beautifully. Uh, when I look at the QTL data, we have thousands of peaks a lot of signals um, obtained on small data sets. But it looks like very, very small fraction of those signals is being realized uh, in downstream phenotypes. And, and we all think that EQTL, uh, EQTLs are all intermediate phenotypes are useful, but we're somehow in different reality here compared to LDL uh, and, and uh, by um, usual biomarkers. I was going to say, so I, I completely agree that there are intrinsic limitations to what measures like sequence conservation can tell us, but at the same time, there's a lot of room for growth, you know, so I, I'd love to see a high quality assembly of every primate species, and we're sort of in a, in a position where that's a very realistic kind of goal. We're talking about hundreds, uh, you know, not millions of, of genome assemblies here, so we're nowhere near saturated the amount of information that we can get from these kinds of comparisons, so it, it and, and I think that will be really, really useful for, for interpreting uh, uh, mutation events. So, uh, go ahead. The, the other thing people should realize, too, is that in terms of the assemblies, you can, do, people can do functional genomics on other primates, too, and I think that really helps, you know, kind of align things and put things together. I mean, you know, it, it, there, there's a lot of simple things that you could do to do a lot better in the, the region. So, I was just going to make a couple of points. Uh, the first thing, I mean, we've talked a lot about creating a, a, a database of true causality. And that's what we really need to test, the prediction equations, and we don't quite have that yet, and I think that Greg has made that point. The other is, um, in terms of conservation, we're essentially doing an experiment with an N of 5 to 15, and we have to remember, I think, that every one of these other species has its own genetic variation, and we've picked one individual from those species to be representative. And while if we look across multiple species, we now have multiple individuals in different species, it's really, uh, we're really looking at very small numbers, and each one of those will have their own private rare and common variants, and who knows at what spot what we're, what we're seeing, so challenges. Quick, so there, there is a sort of technical comment, but it's actually kind of important when you're looking at, at conservation scores, is that it's, it's important to actually eliminate, we actually strip out the human sequence when you're scoring them, because what happens is that when the human is polymorphic, it, the reference assembly captures some of those polymorphic alleles, so it tends to introduce what looks like substitutions, which results in a very large penalty because it's a, from the, the human chimp ancestor to human, it looks like a, a fixed substitution event. So it's essentially one change on a very tiny branch. So it really deflates the, the conservation score. So you get this sort of auto, this tautological correlation between conservation and allele frequency that, so yeah, so the, this notion of diversity within each of those species is important. It actually has a, can have an effect on the scores. I, I think one important thing though that needs, that needs to be uh, conveyed is that there are many people right now in the community that completely equate conservation with function. And, and, but conservation is a way to infer function. It is not function itself. 
And, and that, I mean, function in, in biology is, and at least in the way that it is practiced now, comes out of physiological models where you can break things, watch them act. So I think that that, that, that point has to somehow be encapsulated. And I think um, Greg, Greg's division of things into those three different categories is, is important, I think, mm -hmm. to really explicitly spell that out, the difference between damaging, deleterious, and pathogenic. I think if we can make that point as explicit as possible, that would, that would help to get that out. So do we have the tools now to be able to distinguish amongst those three categories? And I, I would posit the answer is no. Um, and then, and then the, the question is, how, how do we get those, those resources? Uh, I, I don't think we have tools to distinguish, but we have anecdotal evidence. Uh, and um, I think the clearest example where deleterious and damaging go in the opposite direction is our examples of advantageous pseudogenization. We have very convincing uh, stories about um, a, a pseudogenization event being supported by positive selection and, uh, and being potentially beneficial for, uh, for fitness. You wouldn't call them deleterious, but being loss of function events, they are clearly damaging. So we have a variety of stories where, um, again, this I totally agree with Greg that in most cases these three notions uh, correlate and coincide, but we have uh, various studies uh, showing examples where uh, damaging is not deleterious, deleterious is damaging, pathogenic is not, is not deleterious, and, and so forth. Right, so, and, I, and it sounded like there was consensus on that point, that everyone agreed that they are not the same. Um, I, I think the question is, how do we then go forth and figure out which are which in, in what settings? And, and it may differ from in context. What, what may be damaging and deleterious in, in one environment, for example, is damaging and not deleterious in another. Uh, in, in, in current paradigm in molecular evolution, that's extraordinarily difficult because uh, what, what we're doing, we're relying on what we call neutral standard. So we, we look at parameters of variation in variation which we think is neutral or close to be neutral and compare these parameters to what we think is functional. So, so the primary method of inferring selection is to rely on functional evidence on, on, on being damaging or functionally significant. So, so I, think, I think we need completely new approaches to, to, to address these issues in the well-known lens experiment where we have complete conservation um, in ultra-conserved element and you do genetic experiment and you, you detect no phenotype. I mean, this, this exemplifies that um, this inference purely on, on evolutionary grounds is ex extraordinarily difficult. So how many, where do you, you right now think conservation based methods are in terms of if you were going to throw out a ballpark number of the predictive accuracy of where you think it is now and where it could, where you think based on, you know, the gaps in knowledge where it could get. So I guess you're, you're in, in terms of predicting whether something is deleterious? Coding. Let's, let's take the example of coding, coding regions. That's right. Present. Yeah, n not great. I mean, I, there are lots of... So, for example, we can go through and find lots of non-synonymous variants at highly conserved positions at high allele frequencies. So I couldn't tell you what the, what the positive predictive value really truly is at a given site, but it's, it's not high. It's, there, are, there are lots of exceptions, and I, I really don't know what those percentages would be. So I, I can probably quantify with one simple number. So you can plot a pie chart where you're having human common non-synonymous SNPs potentially benign or number of uh, variants which you, you believe are benign, and you can um, compare it with what we think is disease causing, and in how many cases you see exactly the same amino acid variant, not in a single vertebrate, but in, say, two or three species uh, in diverse points on the tree. And the, the difference is dramatic, uh, so things you observe three times on different points of the tree which are uh, disease causing is, I think, below 2%, is, is, is very small. Can you put on, um Number 14 up on the screen. We've, we've gone through and taken our pathogenic and benign variants classified by independent methods um, and then used them to look at some of these different predictive algorithms to see Mike, how. Can you put on number 14? So I just, I, just to give people a sense in doing this for, um, you know, variants classified through the, our clinical laboratory. So this is looking at align GVGD, and so the variants that we've pre-classified as benign are in blue, and those classified as pathogenic. Again, this is through independent methods of classification. So, you know, you see 
they actually work a little better for predicting benign. So for aligned GVDD, the C0 is equivalent to benign and C65 to pathogenic. But there's, you know, they're all over the map. This is polyphen 2. Um, again, you know, benign prediction being a little better than on the um, other end. This is, um, there's two different classifications for polyphen 2. It's the other one, human variation. This is SIFT tolerated versus deleterious. Deleterious is about a 50-50 shot, flip a coin. But, but on the tolerate, it's a little more accurate. Um, this is looking at Grantham difference. Um, this is Blossom scores, uh, Blossom 62, Blossom 80. You know, we've gone through and, and done this sort of thing comparing to our database for a lot of these different sorts of things. And, you know, I think we've all had the same perspective these approaches are good for filtering data and, you know, putting some pr priority on things, but individually they're not great. Now, I, I will say um, we did work with Shamil on a very specific project um, to develop sarcomere polyphen for eight specific genes and did a lot of training. And so Shamil's group did a lot of work to do better alignment of, and Shamil can explain better than I can, to try and train this algorithm to be better. And, th and, and we, I said there has to be a, a zone in the middle of no call. Don't try to call everything benign and pathogenic. Allow some things to be not called. And then, you know, we were able to get that to be much more accurate you know, on the what was being predicted as benign and what was being predicted as pathogenic. So I, I think you can take these tools and, and make them better. Um, but I think the tools that are accurate are going to be different for each gene because the types of mutations that are dysfunctional or deleterious are different types of things. So I think you have to really do some significant training here. So I just put that out there. Yeah, so that's a perfect lead into what I wanted to say, which was that um, it, the tools are actually probably fine, but it's the choice of when to apply them. And I mean, I think I'm stating the obvious, but the utility of a conservation-based method for making these kinds of predictions is going to rest entirely on that the source of the species that you're looking at uh, need to share the phenotype of interest. So the reason it works well for basic metabolism is because we all need to do glycolysis and we all species. Uh, glycolysis, TCA, we have to, uh, mammals have to glycosylate and, you know, whatever. Um, and it's in, totally inappropriate to look at conservation if that phenotype is then not shared across those species. And, and my favorite example is in autism where if you have a dog, you know that dogs have a trillion autistic features. And so to use dogs <laughs> and conservation when you're searching for is just a big mistake because they almost certainly are going to have causative variants uh, as part of their um, background genome. So um, I think that the, the key point here is that you really have to um, define your conservation background to be relevant to the biology in question. And I think we could probably get even all the existing methods could be perform a lot better if we just apply them uh, in a more sensible way to a appropriate background uh, set of species, et cetera. Yeah, I was going to follow up that it's, uh, you know, and this is where stating sort of being more transparent about the biological rationale for any given annotation is important, right? So if I'm doing a, a pharmacogenomic study, well, selection is probably not going to be all that useful because, you know, I'm interested in how we respond to some new molecule that people have never been exposed to before. Whereas if I'm studying, you know, a serious limb defect, then chances are all mammals do this, you use the same sort of molecular process to produce right. that limb. So it, it's much higher chance of conservation being relevant to that kind of problem versus pharmacogenomics. But again, it always has to be clear that none of, none, not conservation, not function, none of them are a one-to-one, -one, you know, it's, it's just not going to happen for a very long time. So it always has to be taken in context of conservation is one bit of data that we use that's very useful on average, but subject to a lot of variation at the individual site level. Uh, yeah. So I, I think what we learned in, in this project with Heidi and um, that uh, we were not able, of course it's very important to use gene specific features and specific training data set, but we were not able to come up with a binary classifier, pathogenic or benign, with any level of accuracy which a reasonable clinical lab would use. So this middle category, so it, it is possible to sacrifice coverage and improve accuracy, uh, but you have to sacrifice a lot of coverage. And, and uh, we had discussion with Sharon Plon um, at, at Baylor and, and uh, she said that they consult patients on treatment options, 
uh, based on genetic diagnostic, and they use conservation as one of the criteria. And uh, she said it's very important to use big middle uh, middle category because if we consult one way, next day there is alligator genome sequence, then conservation score changes, and I have to meet with this patient and say because there is alligator genome, you're <laughs> it's an impossible conversation. <laughs> And I was going to say, one of the categories we hate the most is the, the kids with primary immunodeficiency, because the immune system is not conserved even across primates. And so, I mean, you can have 100 primates, but it's still not going to help figure out uh, an immunodeficiency gene. The only way you can do it is by functionally looking at the effects. And so, you know, whereas when I'm looking at my mitochondrial complex 2, complex 3 proteins, they're conserved all the way down to yeast, so it's kind of, it's pretty easy. And, and so really, there's just this, this concept of the context in which you use the conservation score is very important. I think it sounds good to, to try to think about the context um, in which you're using conservation, but I, I don't think it's qu really doable it's quite so readily. Um, because, you know, the yes, sure, um, you know, autism is, is, is not really, um, you know, the same kind of trait in dogs or else maybe it's selective for and all that. But, but the genes where those mutations are, of course, are not you know, genes for autism, they're genes for something else that are under strong selection for a variety of things. And so you're looking at autism, but that's not really what the nature of selection is at the gene level. So it's, it's actually quite difficult to do that. Um, despite that, um, Shamil, do, do you know if, 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 if anybody has looked at the re relationship between the tendency of Mendelian mutations to be at sites that are conserved as a function of the type of, of disease that they influence and what kinds of variation that we see among classes of disease to try to get at this a little bit more systematically? Uh, so I don't know about the studies beyond dominant versus recessive, uh, but specific phenotypes, uh, I, I can't recall any, any such study. But I completely second your opinion that uh, it is very likely that a lot of selection is pleiotropic. Uh, and uh, to relate selection signal directly to biological effect and specific phenotype may, may, may not be the right, right way of thinking about it. Uh, just one comment. So another thing where, where conservation might have a disconnect is, you know, so, so for example, there could be relatively quickly evolving sites in a protein that uh, that by a, a measure of conservation are, are weak, but if you put a stop code on there, it's bad because it's in the middle of the protein. Uh, and so obviously it's, that site is resistant to stop codons, but nothing else, in which case the conservation score. So again, it's, it's always going to be this hybrid molecular function, evolution, you know, everything you can think of to, to use to interpret. I think there's one more um, aspect that, you know, as Greg mentioned, the conservation story is by no means complete. And, and there are other aspects of, of, you know, the story which I think are not systematically incorporated uh, at, at the moment. I'll give you a, a concrete example. If you look at, let's say, um, the binding, the recognition site of a DNA binding protein, what you typically find is that there are some nucleotides that are conserved, and there are some nucleotides that are not conserved. And what we're looking for there by meaning conserved is that we're seeing the same effectively letter sequence show up. If you take that non-conserved nucleotide and remove it, the site stops functioning. So there is an element of spatial conservation that is, and this is relevant for things like indels, for all kinds of stuff that can show up in genomes that is not being captured at all. And, and that's something that I think is a, you know, is, is, is a major area that could syst potentially be systematically incorporated. Right, so just as another secondary comment, it's, it's so a lot of, in conservation we're not there yet, but we could eventually get closer to that is more allele specific scores. So there are some motifs where you can have an A or a G, but you can't have a T or a C. And we don't, do, we don't really capture that at all in simple measures like it's highly conserved, it's not conserved. But with the deeper evolutionary data, you could start to imagine. We do that with proteins, for example. You can say, oh, they're, it's all valines and isoleucines, but nothing else. So you can start to see patterns of substitutions that is informative beyond a simple measure of, of the rate of evolution. And so we could conceivably get there with, with non-coding sites if we had more genomes and, and more motifs and that sort of thing, but we're a long way from that. I have a general question, which is, if, if it's the case that, which seems likely, that conservation um, is going to be applied, if not gene by gene, regionally in the genome, then how is that going to be? I mean, right now it seems like there are a lot of people out there using it because it's a simple concept to understand. There's data you can look up. 
And but how is that? How are more sophisticated tools or or ways of using this going to be uh, pushed out to the community? Uh, John's question. I mean, I, I do think that I just want to bring up the thread that I brought up earlier about the structural end. I mean, I do think that if you want to get to the next level of, you know, either looking at, for instance, the conservation in the DNA binding motif or looking at what's going on in a, you know, in gene conservation, I mean, clearly the next level is to actually think about it as a molecule, think about it as a three dimensional structure. And, you know, what I think is remarkable is, you know, there's been a tremendous amount of work gone into developing structures of things and so forth. And it's actually amazing how uninformative that's he was pointing out that that's been. But, you know, that's, I guess, the reality of things. But that is, that would be the next level where you actually start to think about things, you know, where you think about the, the base substitutions in terms of, you know, base pairing or binding or what's sort of actually going on. Yeah. So um, maybe this is something that, uh, that uh, you, Shamil, and Heidi are already working on with respect to this example. But this seems to be, you know, the, this seems to have the seed of um, something which can be more holistically brought together with some of the things we were discussing before the break. So when, you know, I start to see this and then think about all the, the very, you know, constructive discussions we had earlier in the morning, you know, I now think that, you know, a patient is going to present with a certain phenotype and you're going to perform exome sequencing. And then based on a history of patients presenting with that phenotype, we're going to have a view, or you probably already do have a view, of what fraction of patients um, actually end up having a mutation in this gene, or at least have a candidate variant in one of these genes. That's an important thing to know. What fraction of the general population who aren't presenting with HCM have rare variants in those categories, the, in those genes, then with the variants in the subset of individuals in both of those categories that do have them, how often do they break down into these groupings? And, you know, getting to a sort of, you know, from a starting point of a whole exome with this type of annotation and with other types of annotation that we can bring in, you know, an ultimate, you know, degree of confidence in specific variants. and. Um, you know, that may be sort of a, a community outcome that while there won't be, again, a one-size-fits-all, you know, uh, answer, there are so many different clinical areas in which we have 10, 15, 20, 25 genes that we customarily inquire and which we expect to explain, well, give or take, half of the cases that present. And I think we can, we can move as a community towards treating that in a consistent and, and in a very productive way. I wanted to comment uh, simultaneously John's question marks and marks. Um, uh, the question is where we're going and this is one possibility is, I don't know whether this is a realistic possibility because uh, many people uh, noted that different genes, different phenotypes, different functional categories, so you can largely customize, make develop the method specifically to each phenotype and each gene context. And uh, to Mark's point about structure, so in this particular case, there is a unique property of some of these proteins. We have structure in active conformation and a non-active conformation, and you can track movement for, of each amino acid between active and inactive conformation. Happens to be a very useful feature. It's a structural feature. It's very useful. There's no way you can generalize it, right? It's, it's specific to, 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 to circumeric proteins, and we uh, were lucky to have the structural pairs. Uh, so this is potential way forward, but maybe it's over overly ambitious to think that this is where we should go uh, on, the, on the global genome scale. So, I mean, the, the number of individuals working on conservation uh, is, is relatively small, probably compared to the number of clinical labs that there are out there, you know, dealing with, uh, you know, uh, data. And, and it's also more organized. And, I mean, it seems like one of the key themes that keeps coming over, up over and over again is the value of centralization. And it, it would seem that since there's so many people interested in you know, applying it, and we agree that there's value and there's, you know, room to, to, to grow and expand, that, that, that it would be perhaps a nice model uh, thing to try to build a centralized resource that could be systematically used, so at least all the clinical labs and everybody's using the same uh, 
score, set of scores uh, for looking at things. So how feasible is that? I mean, how, I, mean, would I would think it's it? quite feasible it given the fact that, easy, yeah, that, the con that the community is organized already, so at least the ones working on conservation. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, that, that's, I think it's fairly, fairly practical, especially, I mean, ENCODE has already essentially gathered most of, the, most of those people in one umbrella anyway, so that, you know, there are, that's a very conceivable goal to sort of unify those kind of measures. And also organizations like KJ, JVS, uh, there's NIPSIC group, I think, and, and ISMB. So, so there are groups which try to get people together and, and uh, come up with some standards. I'm not sure this is going to work, but there, there is some activity there. I mean, you could imagine not only organizing things, but also, uh, you know, the, the community, but also, for example, at annual ASHG meetings, having a, you know, placeholder symposium or whatever that's built around this topic to, to you know, increase awareness, et cetera. So. So, so maybe for the, the epidemiologist at the table, you could just very carefully re-specify what it was that you need specifically. So, so, so what, what is it that you're, you're talking about building? It's, a, it's a, a, a standard way of applying conservation scores or estimating them or some different sort of description of conservation so that it's, it's not just, you know, the allele but something else. What, what is it that you'd, you'd like to articulate there? Well, I mean, my thought in, in proposing it is that there are continuous developments that are going on. And, you know, Sharon Plon doesn't need to, to align the alligator genome. <laughs> so, I mean, there's some central resource that, that's going to do that. And, and in other words, that, that there would be great value in having one place that always has the most up-to-date information that, that is agreed upon by the community that's generating it. For the annotation, but it sounded like you were talking a little bit more about uh, conservation is, is, is a blunt tool right, right now, the way that it's applied, and, and you wanted some more specific way of applying that tool. Did I hear that right or, or no? Well, I mean, th so that was, you're, you're talking there about the gene specific. So that would be, for example, if there's a centralized resource, that would be the, you know, the ultimate place to push out, start pushing out things like, you know, gene specific annotations, et cetera, where there's a, you know, where there could be feedback for the, from the community. I mean, obviously it requires work, it requires patient information interactions, but potentially there are many more genes that could be annotated in the same way, but it's got to be, but centralization is the key to doing that. Maybe also unified benchmarks of accuracy in specific contexts, uh, so if the community can develop this type of standards, this may, may be useful. So one of the challenges I've had is there's a lot of tools out there. And you know, a colleague of mine had gathered, I think I want to say 18 different tools, um, and was then trying to do a similar validation like we had done with the poly sarcomere polyphen. Um, and he took a set of known mutations in a few different genes, um, benign and pathogenic, to validate. And he actually did it, a computational method to combine in meth you know, three different way or um, bring in all the tools and figure out which set of three methods combined together gave the best predictions, and then computationally did it in thousands of combinations and, and selected three different tools that were optimal for each of the three different genes, right? So they actually came up with, with different things. And that, that underscores, I think, what we were talking about is each gene may have sort of different um, things that lead to that. But at the end of the day, each of these tools we don't understand the accuracy of each of them. Um, and so it's been quite arbitrary what people have actually chosen to use. Oh, I use Polyphen, or I use SIFT, or you know, right now I'm using the ones that, because we use Alamit as a way to more efficiently get access to some of this data, we end up using the three that Alamit as a software package has embedded in it, which is Polyphen, SIFT, and Align GBG. But it's, it's highly, you know, arbitrary today as to what labs use, and, and there's just no capacity to use all 18 of them. And then I also think that each of these different, whether it's 18 or whatever number of tools, are more or less independent from each other. So there's a tendency to say, well, if I use more, and they all, and the 10 that I'm using all say the same thing, that that's better accuracy than if I had one saying one thing, right? Which may or may not be true depending on the independence of the underlying methodologies that each of these tools use. And so I think it would be great to have some sort of comparative process to say, well, these five tools use very different underlying things. So if you use the three of them, you'll have independent assessments. And if they're all the same, you have a higher probability of being correct. But anyway, I, you know, the long story short, I, I think it's still challenging to figure out, even if we had a centralized place, what, what are the methods that 
that should be used to do this. And the other thing is, you know, for homology and conservation, being able to visually see the alignments is critical because there's always errors in those alignments. And I want to see that not only is it conserved, but it's conserved on the back, or it's not conserved on the background of a conserved region. Because if the whole region is non-conserved, but then it probably does something different, and I shouldn't be trusting that data. And so that's why we always make our fellows take a screenshot of the alignment and paste that in for the geneticist to review, and not just have an automated numerical number of conservation. I just wanted to follow up on your point. I mean, maybe Shamil was alluding to this, but one nice way of um, kind of organizing this thing is they have um, to almost have like a competition, like CASP, where people would try to predict deleterious mutations and some people in these communities would hold them back and you know then then you would reveal them at this at this thing. I think that would be quite I mean you maybe have something to say on that. Yeah. Right. So uh, John Malt and Stephen Brenner now yeah. ran KG, which is critical assessment of genome interpretation and I don't know how many people here participate in the challenges. Uh, and I think there will be a challenge this year, smaller challenge than last year. Uh, it's still people still trying to find the right way to, to run the competition blind assessment of the tools. It also includes complex phenotypes, although oh, last, last year some people were able to predict whether somebody has Crohn's disease with 90% accuracy, which is way above heritability, so there are certain things to, <laughs> <laughs> to, 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 to wake in this competition, but, the, but this initiative is out there and please, please check it out. I mean, I, I think that there's one, th one thing that should be said is that there is an existing paradigm for resolving these things, which has not really been employed. I mean, you know, we think of like clinical medicine as, oh, you know, they're just off seeing patients. But clinical medicine, I mean, we're not the ones with all the, oh, oh, you know, we're not the only ones with all the toys. There are lots of, of, of rules and scores in clinical medicine. In fact, there, there are thousands of them, these risk prediction rules. Somebody does a study, I've got, you know, 500 patients show up with epistaxis, what are the causes, how can I predict their outcomes, et cetera. There, these things show up all the time. And, and inevitably what happens is there are 20 different risk prediction scores that come up, and then, you know, they don't just duke it out at meetings, they just say, all right, somebody organizes a prospective study. Because everything we're doing so far is retrospective. I mean, somebody just needs to just take that model, put it forward, organize a, some, you know, wealth, put together perspective. And at that point, out of the 20, there's usually a couple of winners, you know, a winner or maybe a couple in certain circumstances, and it clears up the field dramatically. And I think that is something that is, you know, can clearly be, uh, uh, you know, fostered by NIH. Other comments? Great. Well, we're, we are just about at, at uh, lunch. We actually had scheduled lunch at 1240, and, and we do, you know, respect the fact people like to get out a little bit early when they can. So, um, but, but when we need to continue a discussion, we, we certainly will. So, I, I, it's hard to get people back at five minutes before an hour, but um, if, if you could come back at five minutes before the hour, and we'll plan on starting the, uh, the uh, experimental data uh, talk uh, uh, discussion. There are lunches for those who ordered them just outside here. You only have 20 minutes, so it's going to be very tough to get something anywhere else, but run if you can. And we'll, we'll see you back in 20 minutes.